tonight we have a fantastic speaker, uh, Jennifer Weissman, and we are so glad she's able to join us. Dr. Weisman is an astronomer, author, and speaker. She studies the process of star and planet formation in our galaxy using radio, optical, and infrared telescopes. She's also interested in national science policy and public science engagement and directs the program of Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She received her BS in physics from MIT, discovering the Weissman Skiff Comet in 1987, and continues her studies at Harvard, earning a PhD in astronomy in 1995. She's currently a senior astrophysicist at the Goddard Flight Space Flight Center. Dr. Weissman is a fellow of the American Scientific Affiliation, a network of Christians in science. She has authored several essays addressing the relationship of astronomy and Christian faith and frequently gives public talks on the excitement of scientific discovery. She grew up on an Arkansas farm, enjoying late night star stargazing walks with her parents and pets. Thank you for joining us, Jennifer. Okay, well, I'm just so honored to join you this evening, and it looks like you've got uh, quite a big group, so this is wonderful, and I recognize some of you, so, um, it's good to see those of you that I've known as friends for quite a while. Uh, hi, Judy and others. Um, and for those of you I haven't met, um, I, I'm meeting you this way and I hope to meet you in person sometime. So um, this is just terrific that we can be together for this uh, quote unquote star party. <laughs> I wish we could actually um, you know, be out together with telescopes and looking at uh, God's handiwork in the sky through our own telescopes, and some of you may have your own and may be doing that. Uh, I don't know what the weather's like where you are uh, today, but... Um, it's raining tonight, oh, unfortunately. All right. Well, that's one of the problems with uh, astronomy from the ground, but I'll be talking a little bit about <laughs> space-based astronomy. So, um, and I see we have some young ones uh, on uh, online too. So that's very good. Uh, we're glad you're, I'm glad you are interested in stars and planets and space. So let's see then if I can share my screen. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a tour of the universe from what we can see um, with professional telescopes, which um, really are quite uh, amazing in terms of what they can reveal that we can't see with our own eyes. It's kind of ironic that humanity has basically blinded ourselves to, um, to the night sky uh, uh, with our street lights, you know, uh, and that's very sad. Most people cannot walk out there homes and see a, a sky filled with stars because we've blinded ourselves. And yet with our professional telescopes, we're seeing deeper into the universe than ever before and sharing those images worldwide because of the internet. So it's kind of a, a switch in the kinds of eyes that we use. I'm just gonna talk a bit, <laughs> I'm just gonna try to cover the entire universe here in the next uh, uh, 50 minutes or so, and then we'll have some conversation after that. So. Um, so let's talk about our awesome universe. Let's talk about what we're finding. And, and then let's speculate a little bit beyond just the observations to what we might uh, conclude um, beyond just the science. Uh, um, what about the significance of life um, in this vast and awesome universe? All right. Well, if you didn't have to contend with a cloudy sky, you might be able to see something like this. Um, this is the core of a very dense star cluster called Omega Centauri in our galaxy. Some of you who do have your own telescopes probably look at globular clusters of stars. These are densely packed uh, collections of stars that are held close to each other by their mutual gravity, but they don't just fall into each other because they also have some motion, some random motions that keep them swirling around. But in a dense cluster like this, if we were looking with a telescope from the ground, you'd probably just see a big a smudge of blended starlight. 
But this image was taken from a telescope in space, from the Hubble Space Telescope, which enables a sharper resolution. Our atmosphere can cause light to get blurred um, as it passes through our turbulent atmosphere, and some of it gets filtered out. Even on a clear night, we can't see ultraviolet light uh, coming through at the atmosphere. But if we can get above the atmosphere, we can get much sharper images, much higher angular resolution, and even see certain types of light that we cannot see from through the filtered atmosphere on planet Earth. So here's this beautiful cluster of stars seen from space with the newest camera on the Hubble telescope. And it reveals this rich range of color from red uh, all the way through to blue and even beyond blue because this camera sees ultraviolet light and all the way through the visible colors and into the infrared part of the light spectrum. So you can see that stars are different colors here and those colors represent different temperatures of their outer atmospheres. And because the resolution is so great, you can differentiate star from star. And even those little yellowish greenish dots are stars. If our sun were in such a cluster, it would look like one of those stars. And we can then do spectroscopy on the individual stars because we can separate them out in a clear image like this and find out their compositions. And we realize in clusters like this that the stars are old stars. These are some of the original stars in our galaxy. We also see a great beauty here. I think of this as like a collection of gemstones and just reminds us of the, the majesty of our universe. And you get extra credit if you can find the verse in the New Testament that says star differs from star in splendor. All right. So here you can see that visually. So we do live in an incredible universe that inspires, I hope, wonder and awe. This is another one of my favorite images here that shows a cluster of stars that have recently, cosmically speaking, recently formed out of the dust and gas that exists in our galaxy between stars. There are many, many clouds of gas and dust in our galaxy, making it most of the volume of our galaxy. But occasionally, if you get a pocket of this turbulent gas that's compressed enough, the, the mass will collapse into clumps of denser dust and gas. And if there's enough mass, the pressure in the middle of that clump will enable the continued accretion and eventually the compression in the center enabling the process of fusion where hydrogen atoms combine and through a series of reactions, create helium and other atoms and products and release light. So that's what a star is doing. It's basically a collapsed ball of gas that is creating the process of fusion, which is it itself creating light and also producing heavier elements. In this case, these are massive stars in the middle here, and they form very quickly relative to low mass stars. <laughs> We're still talking about uh, usually millions of years, but, um, but they uh, send out light that ionizes the leftover gas surrounding them out of which they form. So that's what the colorful gas is. It's being ionized by these massive stars. And the winds from these stars are, are shaping and carving out structures like columns in the gas. And eventually that gas will all be blown away. But some of the lower mass stars that take longer to form are still forming in that leftover gas. So when we see beautiful nebulae like this for astronomers, it also tells us that this is activity. This is a, a region where stars are still forming and have recently formed and, and still have leftover gas that can be ionized and lit up. It reminds us that our universe is not stagnant. Um, it is productive, it's fruitful, it's active. And so we've seen quite a few of these amazing nebulae that uh, uh, some of them are indicative of active star forming regions like this one. 
And this air region, which is in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is the little sister galaxy right next to the Milky Way, and the upper right uh, reddish cloud is a region, again, being churned up and ionized by massive stars recently formed. The lower left weird thing is just one star. It's a massive star called the wolf Rye star that has these hiccups every once in a while where it, uh, where it expels part of its atmosphere. And that creates these surrounding shells that look like this big donut uh, to us. So again, reminds us that the universe is active. So we study the universe now using different kinds of telescopes and we use them in complement with one another. So uh, uh, the, these are just some examples. The one on the top is the famous Hubble Space Telescope. It's about the size of a city bus and it is whirling around planet Earth, which you can see below. Uh, but it's not too far above the surface of the Earth. It's only about 350 miles up. So it's basically just high enough to get above most of our atmosphere for these clearer images. We send commands up to the telescope from the ground, and then the, the telescope transmits data back to the ground receivers. It's been operating for over 31 years now because astronauts have returned to it on the space shuttle several times to refurbish and repair the observatory. So it's still in actually very good shape doing good science. There are many other space telescopes too that have operated or are operating or are being designed for the future, including the James Webb Space Telescope that should be launched in December this year and start its journey out to a million miles away from Earth, much farther than Hubble, and will do infrared light observations from that vantage point. But we also have telescopes that are very active on the ground and, and impo doing important things. So the Keck telescopes on the lower left in Hawaii and the ALMA Radio Telescope Observatory in South America in Chile, you can see on the lower right. Um, these observatories pick up different kinds of radiation or they have different fields of view or they can uh, do different have different capabilities for observations than other telescopes, even Hubble. So not any observatory has all the capabilities that we need. We need to use these different facilities. Um, I think of like different instruments in an orchestra where the conductor will call out the violins or the flutes or the percussion or the trumpets and pull it all together to get a beautiful piece of music. Well, here we have astronomers pulling different types of information from different, using different tools to study galaxies or stars or planets. And uh, we need these different types of technological tools. Of course, we're also exploring using things other than telescopes. We can actually go to places in our own solar system. Humans have gone to the moon and to low earth orbit. And we're thinking about sending humans to Mars in the not too distant future. And we're certainly already sending probes to other moons and planets that can send back information to us. In fact, it's the probes that got me interested in space in the first place. When I was in my uh, teenage years, the NASA Voyager probes were sending back images from our solar system and some of the first close-up images of moons around some of these planets. And I was just fascinated by this. And so I wanted to be part of this Perfect. industry. I didn't know exactly how, but, uh, but I knew from that point that I thought humans sending probes to other planets and moons is one of the coolest things we've ever done. And I still think that. So here's the Perseverance rover. Um, recently sent to Mars with all kinds of gadgetry on it to study the, uh, the environment of Mars, the surface of Mars, what could be under the surface of Mars, what Mars might, must have been like in the past when it had liquid water uh, flowing on its surface and why, why did it become a cold desert and could it have harbored life in the past and how would we know? Um, so uh, that's the view from uh, Perseverance looking out on the Martian surface, which is pretty neat. 
All right. So what are we learning from these observations? Well, uh, you know, this could be a wonderful multi-day lecture, but uh, in brief, we're learning that the universe is beautiful, it's active, it's enormous, and it's progressive. And I don't mean that at the moment in a political sense. I mean it in the sense of changing over time in the direction that enables planets and life. So let's take a look at some of these features. Um, I told, told you about stars being born, but stars also eventually die out. They run out of that inner fuel, the hydrogen and, and the other elements that can sustain fusion. And when they can no longer sustain this fusion reaction in their core, they become unstable. And most stars will simply start to expel their outer atmospheres and then basically cool off as a white dwarf. So here's a star that's expelling its outer atmosphere as it becomes unstable. You can't see the star, but it's buried there in the middle. And there must be some kind of a disk of dust-like debris around the star and possibly some rotation because the, the expelled material is coming out in a bipolar fashion. And it's beautiful. It looks like a butterfly. So this is called the butterfly nebula. It's important to note that stars like this expelling their material or the more massive stars that actually explode in a supernova are sharing their material, sharing their created wealth with the surrounding uh, space environment. So this fusion process that stars go through for sometimes millions, sometimes billions of years, creates heavier elements such as oxygen, nitrogen, iron, and through the explosion process, even elements heavier than iron and expels them into interstellar space. They get mixed up in the interstellar gas and dust, and then they become swept up in subsequent star formation. And so it is stars that are what I call God's factories that are amazing at producing these heavier elements and then dispersing them into the broader galactic environment. And that enables subsequent generations of stars to form with heavier materials which enables uh, the formation of dusty disks around stars where planets can form and where we on planet Earth can even have uh, what we need for, for life, to sustain life. So uh, stars are part of the cosmic ecosystem. All right, let's look at what we might have seen if this had been a dark night, a clear night where you could go out with a telescope or even with your unaided eye, you could have looked up and seen Orion here. Um, and I showed this once at a talk I gave in Australia, and they all looked at me and said, hey, it's upside down. <laughs> but uh, this is the view that we often see from North America. And um, those of you who know this constellation can recognize Orion's belt and sword and up at the top, the big red uh, star, Betelgeuse, red giant, and the lower right is the bright blue star, Rigel. In the middle, the belt and the sword of Orion, if you look closely, even with your naked eye in a dark place or with binoculars or with a backyard telescope, you can see that those stars, many of them look kind of fuzzy. And astronomers call anything fuzzy a nebula or nebulous. So looking closely at these nebulous material, uh, you can actually see uh, that there's a lot going on. So I'm going to now zoom in from this image, which was created from a telescope on the ground, to a very much smaller field of view. So the Hubble Space Telescope sees not this wide swath of the sky, but a smaller field of view that basically encompasses this one region right there. Um, you can already see in this through this telescope's image that that's kind of a reddened region. If we zoom in on that reddened region with the Hubble Space Telescope, which gives us more detail, we actually see this. So uh, this is the Orion Nebula. 
It's majestic. It's one of these regions I told you about where massive stars have recently formed. In fact, there's four of them in here that are called the trapezium. And at least one of them is responsible for lighting up this entire nebula. It's got so much energy that its photons of light are energetic enough to, to hit the surrounding gas, separate the protons from the electrons and the surrounding gas atoms. And then when those atoms recombine and recover, they emit this colorful light. So the Orion Nebula is beautiful, it's lit up, it's active. And this region is near and dear to my heart because I studied it with radio telescopes for my own doctoral thesis, which in my case, they looked beyond this lit up region to a much bigger dark cloud behind it that's not yet lit up because the stars forming inside it have not yet turned on. But we can see with radio telescopes how the gas is, is fragmenting and coalescing into future stars. And we can see with infrared telescopes, some of those baby stars that are called protostars. But here in this visible light region, we're seeing the front cover of Orion. We're seeing the lit up region where stars that have fully formed are ionizing the gas. And if we look closely, we can actually see smaller stars that are still trying to form in this turbulent region, but it's hard because the stars that have already formed have winds that are uh, turbulent and stirring up the gas and it makes it hard for other slower to form stars to do so. But nevertheless, here's a couple of them that I'm blowing up here so you can see them. And these little stellar objects trying to form in the torrent and trying to accrete more material onto themselves through gravity, um, they have these darker regions around them. You can see one of them with a disc-like uh, region around it that that's oriented to us kind of face on and the other one kind of edge on here. It turns out that these dusty regions around these stellar objects are about the diameter of our own solar system. And we now know through careful observations using all kinds of telescopes that stars in our own epoch of time nearly always form with a disk of debris around them. Again, that's heavier elements created from previous generations of stars. And it's in these regions that planets form. So these are the planet forming zones. Planets form along with their parent stars. And apparently they are very, very common uh, given our recent discoveries of how common exoplanets are in, uh, in star systems beyond our own. In fact, here's an artist's conception of a planetary system discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope. Kepler basically focused for years on a whole bunch of stars in our galaxy and just stared at them to see which of them kind of periodically had slight dimming. And for some of them, that dimming was caused because they have planets that are orbiting them. And when the planet orbits in front of the star toward our line of sight, it blocks out some of the starlight. So this is a very real system with six planets but it's an artist's conception because we don't yet have the technology to take such a nice, beautiful picture of such planets. We, just, we, uh, we detect these things indirectly by looking at their uh, effect on the parent star, in this case, transiting the parent star. This system has six planets in very tight orbits that are kind of much closer than Mercury would be in our own solar system. These planets are called exoplanets. Exo means outside of our solar system. So exoplanets have become a very hot topic in astronomy. When I was starting graduate school, we didn't know of any exoplanets. We, we had not discovered even one planet outside of our own solar system. We suspected they might be there because why would our sun be different from other stars? But we didn't have the technology or the techniques to really find them. It's very hard to detect something that's small and a billion times dimmer than the parent star that it's, that it's next to and, and lost in the star's glare. So you have to develop these kind of indirect detective techniques. All right, let's look out beyond uh, the stars and planets in our own Milky Way to other galaxies and other galaxies are amazing. Here's 
a spiral galaxy that I think is particularly beautiful. It's called uh, uh, NGC 1309, such a poetic name. It just kind of rolls off the tongue. And we see these background galaxies too. There's so many stars in galaxies like this that the light from them just all blends together in the core. And you can see these beautiful symmetric spiral arms. Uh, and most of the volume in these galaxies is made up of this gas and interstellar dust and dark matter that we can't even see, but we see its gravitational effects. We think our Milky Way looks something like this. Um, and with our sun along one of the spiral arms, but we can't get out far enough from our own position to look back and take a, a selfie of our own galaxy. So we have to deduce that from just looking around. Here's an artist's conception of our own Milky Way based on our observations. And if you look, there's so many stars in the middle that the light just blends together. But we actually believe that in the very middle, there's something called a supermassive black hole where a lot of the mass has migrated over billions of years as gravity eventually pulls things toward the center and friction. And as things fall together, the mass grows and grows to the point where uh, the mass is enormous. Its gravitational pull is enough to pull it into a small enough volume that it becomes a black hole, meaning not even light can escape the distorted space of this compact glob of, of mass. And we can tell it's there not by seeing it, but by seeing the motions of stars and material right around it, because around a black hole, material would orbit um, according to normal laws of orbit. So we can see fast orbits of material indicative of something very massive and compact in the middle of our galaxy. But if you look down toward the bottom of this image, you see a little arrow that says our solar system. That would be where our sun is and the planets like Earth orbiting that one star. So that's where we are right now. Um, if you felt disoriented, I hope you understand where you are now. And galaxies come in different shapes and sizes and orientations. Here's a couple of spiral galaxies, one edge on, one face on. You can see how much dust there is in spiral galaxies. Spiral galaxies tend to be the ones that still have a lot of fuel for forming new stars. The more football shaped or elliptical galaxies tend to have run out of fuel and they're, they're full of stars, but they're not forming a lot of new stars. And if you look in ultraviolet light, which is what these images uh, show off, you can see even better these regions and galaxies where there are these lit up nebulae where stars are forming like the Orion Nebula, but in other galaxies along their spiral arms, just beautiful. We've also learned that galaxies um, throughout cosmic history have interacted, they merged together. Um, even though the universe is, we now know expanding and most galaxies or all galaxies are kind of caught up in expanding space, which means most of them are moving apart from each other. Nevertheless, if galaxies are close enough to each other that their gravitational pull um, is significant, then that gravity will dominate and pull these galaxies together and they will merge. So here's a couple of galaxies that are being drawn together. And as we look out into the distant universe with sensitive telescopes, we can actually tell that back in time, because looking farther out in space means looking farther back in time, it's taken more time for the light to get to us, that back in time, when the universe was more compact, there were more mergers. So galaxy mergers seem to be an important part of building up the mass of galaxies over time. Galaxies will be drawn together, disrupted, but their mass will increase as they become one combined galaxy. And we can see evidence that our own Milky Way is, has had mergers in the past. Um, here's another pair of galaxies that are farther along in the merging process and that turbulence that's spun up by these two galaxies being drawn together has actually pressed the gas together in many places and, and, and cited more star formation. So you can see those beautiful lit up regions again where bursts of new stars are forming. So sometimes we call these regions star bursts because the, the turbulence of the merger has 
basically fertilize a whole lot of new stars to form. Now, if you think we're, this is all esoteric, um, uh, our own Milky Way is not only the product of mergers, but we can see that we are headed toward another one. Um, the Andromeda galaxy, which is our nearest neighbor, big spiral galaxy, is on a head-on collision course with the Milky Way. Fortunately, the, uh, the modeling that we do on computers shows that when galaxies merge, there's still a lot of empty space between the stars. So stars don't typically collide with other stars. It's just that the gravitational and tidal pressures uh, tend to disrupt the overall structure of the galaxy as they merge into one. So our night sky will look very different in about 4 billion years if our sun and earth are still here at that time. Sometimes those mergers look kind of spooky. This is an image that was released last Halloween of a, a pair of merging galaxies. Their outer regions are getting disrupted by one another and it looks like they're looking right back at us. So it's a nice Halloween image. We also know that the universe is enormous in both space and time. So here we have this galaxy, but uh, for the last hundred years now, we've known that there are plenty of other galaxies, that we, the Milky Way is just one. And now we know that there are in fact, hundreds of billions of galaxies. My favorite image being the, the Hubble deep field. Here's the ultra deep field. These blips of light here are not stars for the most part. There's a couple of foreground stars in the picture, but for the most part, these are other galaxies. Um, image when the Hubble telescope was pointed at, in a region in space that doesn't have any nearby stars, uh, many to drown out the image and just collecting light for several days. So, uh, and, and this was the result of these faint, faint points of light that show up in the exposure and uh, you can see spirals and you can see elliptical shapes and you can see these little dots. They're all galaxies. This is like looking through a drinking straw, a little tiny area of the sky, but imagine this extrapolated over the whole sky and that's the universe we live in. If we could get far enough from our own Milky Way and look back, we would see something like this and our Milky Way would be like one of the little spirals in the, on the left there. So every time I look at this, I'm just amazed. I mean, I try to imagine what would it be like if I could blink my eyes and just go to one of these random galaxies and look around. Um, and of course, each galaxy contains billions, sometimes hundreds of billions of stars. And if they're anything like our own Milky Way galaxy, most of those stars have planets and planetary systems forming in them. So, you know, you do the math of, uh, something like 200 billion galaxies in our universe times something like 200 billion stars in each galaxy. Um, that's a lot of stars. And then times at least one planet on average per star, that's a lot of planets. Now, some of these are closer to us than others. That's the other amazing uh, feature of astronomy and sensitive telescopes is that we can basically look back in time the, what we're seeing here is the light, not as it is today from these galaxies, but as it was when the light began its journey to us. So for the, for, for the nearest galaxies, we're looking a few million years back in time as to how they looked then. But for the more distant galaxies in this image, we're actually seeing them as they were billions of years back in time, closer to the very beginning of the universe. So by comparing these galaxies, from more distant space to more nearby space, we can see how galaxies have changed over time. Now, gauging these distances is not trivial. It's one of the hardest um, activities in, in astronomy, but it's done very carefully in different methods. And uh, by looking farther into space and time, we're able to see what the universe was like in its infancy. So here's a little chart that kind of shows you an example of how telescopes getting better over time can see deeper into time. So the, the, on the left, you see graphics of telescopes and different instruments on the Hubble telescope that have improved over the years. 
and become more sensitive. And at the bottom is this future web telescope that isn't yet operating, but should launch in December and start doing science sometime next year. And as these cameras and facilities get more sensitive, they can see fainter and fainter objects, which means we can see more distant galaxies. That's what those arrows are pointing out. Well, if we're seeing more distant galaxies, we're seeing them as they were farther back in time. So the timeline on the bottom, which is compressed and not linear, goes from the beginning of the universe, which would be off, to the, off the right-hand side of this image, to today, which is on the left side. And so we can sample material that we can observe from the very distant universe in these baby galaxies with ones that have gone through several mergers over time and had generations of stars come and go like our Milky Way and see how things have changed. We believe from different lines of evidence that our universe as we know it began with an incredible burst of inflation, something about 13.8 billion years ago. And we're now able to see some of the first galaxies from within the first, that first 0.8 of the 13.8 billion year history of the universe. And this web telescope seeing sensitively into infrared light will be able to see even earlier galaxies than the Hubble telescope can see. So what are we seeing? Well, if you pull out from this image, these galaxies and line them up by their different distances, you see how they've changed. So in this case, the galaxy images have been pulled out and placed in these little circles so that the more distant ones are in the circles on the right and the more nearby ones to us in space and time are the ones in circles on the left. So you can visually see how galaxies have changed over time. In the early universe, they were small, they were ratty looking. And then over the billions of years of time, they have merged together and grown into bigger objects. They've taken on spiral structures. And if you do spectral analysis of the stars and the material and the gas in these galaxies, you can see how the ones closer to us in time and space have uh, heavier, more heavier elements like, like carbon that have been produced by generation, previous generations of stars. So it takes generations of stars and, and mergers of galaxies to build galaxies up into the types of galaxies like our Milky Way, where we have uh, heavier elements and stars with disks and planets and even life on at least one planet. And so from these amazing observations, we can tell that the universe has developed over billions of years of time and it continues to mature and change with the production of stars within hundreds of billions of galaxies and those stars producing heavier elements that enable the formation of planets around current generation stars. And, and these are providing conditions needed for life uh, to exist and thrive on at least one planet, our planet Earth. So, take a deep breath. Does this imply that the universe has a purpose? You can see how the universe has transformed from its beginning inflation, its beginning burst of energy to a universe filled with galaxies and stars potentially planets, and at least some life. Does that imply that that was the purpose for the universe in the first place? And we can you know, delve into fine tuning arguments and things like that. Now I have just moved from the scientific discussion away from the science or beyond the science to a discussion of interpretation, of philosophy, of even theology. And not everyone, not even all scientists understand that transition. When we go from studying things that are measurable as scientific instruments to studying things, to contemplating uh, what they might inform about the bigger questions that we as humans have. Years ago, the Templeton Foundation asked quite a few world thought leaders uh, this question, does the universe have a purpose? 
scientists, historians, theologians, philosophers, ethicists, they all pretty much agreed on the scientific picture that I just described to you of, of the evolution of the universe. But they have very different opinions on the philosophical interpretation of this. Does the universe have a purpose? Well, you can see some of their one word answers here. Um, but each of them was also asked to write a little essay, a one page explaining why their answer is what it is. So I'll give you a few examples. So a Professor Atkins, a scientist in the UK, said that in the absence of evidence, the only reason to suppose that the universe has a purpose is sentimental, wishful thinking, which underlies all religion an unreliable tool for the discovery of truth of any kind. All right, that's a pretty strong opinion. But we also get a strong opinion from Professor John Hott uh, of Georgetown University in the US. Uh, he says, uh, does the universe have a purpose? Well, yes, the fact that we're even asking such a question suggests that there's an affirmative answer. Um, and the search for meaning, perhaps our most distinctive trait as human beings, is not some longing that somehow lifts, lifts us out of the place of nature. Uh, we're part of nature. So if we accept evolution as he believes that we must, our longing for meeting is part of nature in the same sense that birdsong and the howling of wolves are nature. And Jane Goodall says, certainly, she says, uh, at least in her experience, she says science typically scoffs at any belief in a God and tells us that we have a God gene and the tendency toward religious belief is simply part of our biological makeup, like the human smile. And yet, even if this were so, we would still need to ask why, why should we be programmed to believe in a God? And why are the laws of physics designed to make life ever more complex? And where did those laws come from? Now, Jane Goodall, um, in her uh, legacy of studying the lives of chimpanzees, has opened up our understanding of really the, the, the significance of life and feeling of other creatures on our planet. And she recently just won the Templeton Prize. I would throw in here this caution to beware of what is coined nothing buttery. I didn't coin this term, but nothing buttery means beware of any statement that that's, um, simplifies humans to be nothing but, that reduces us. So for example, uh, uh, is the scientific explanation for a natural phenomenon like our behavior, the whole story, are we nothing but? our chemical makeup? Are we nothing but our genes? Are we nothing but our neurological makeup? Uh, anything like that, reductionism is not the full story of what it means to be humans and whether or not we have a bigger purpose. These kinds of questions often go beyond the science. And, and for a group like this, we might wonder if theology and science can come to complementary conclusions, even if they are asking different kinds of questions. Um, I would say so. I would imagine most of you do too. Um, Sir John Polkinghorne, who passed away this year, just a phenomenal and jovial thinker, was a physicist and an Anglican priest. He wrote wonderful books about the, the, the complementarity in his view of physics and faith and his strong Christian faith carried, uh, he carried with him through the rest of his life. He said, science and theology are both concerned with the search for truth. In consequence, they complement each other rather than contrast each other. Of course, the two disciplines focus on different dimensions of truth, but they share a common conviction that there is truth to be sought. And I think that is significant as some other uh, disciplines in our area would argue that there isn't any such thing as, as ultimate truth. And here we have uh, cases where at least Western theology and science are believing that there are right and wrong answers and we can uh, progress in knowledge in this way. Dr. Nancy Adelman, uh, 
professor of psychology at Catholic University talks in the more personal level of, of scientists and people of faith. She says, scientists and people of faith speak a common language, which is awe and wonder about the world at large. We can meet on common ground and consider our common interest. I kind of like this direction. Instead of having this discussion of science and theology and religion kind of all up in the the academic heady realm of concepts, which is fine, but it's much more rewarding if we actually talk about it in terms of bringing people together and talk about how we have, how the way we view the world and reality can complement one another and getting to know each other is a very helpful way of having this conversation. All right, let me just speed through some of this, but uh, significance comes into play since we are discovering that in fact, planets are common and Copernicus uh, made us realize that we're not in the center of anything. What does that change our sense of significance? Um, I was, I've recently been uh, getting shoulder therapy and my shoulder therapist when he found out I was an astronomer, instead of saying, wow, cool, you work and you, you must observe the universe. How cool is that? He said, don't tell me anymore. Every time I hear about the universe, it depresses me because it makes me re realize how meaningless our life is and uh, how insignificant we are. And I felt so bad. I was like, you know, is there something about learning about these discoveries that compels people to think that they must conclude their lives are meaningless? Um, I don't think that has to be the case, but that's a philosophical perspective. What does it mean to be significant? Do you need to be in the center to be significant? Do you need to be long lived? Do you need to be rare or common or usual or unusual? Um, these are philosophical choices. Um, we, uh, and in fact, um, there's a very interesting work by um, literary professor Dennis Danielson, who published in the American Journal of Physics, and then later uh, Mono Singham, published in Physics Today, the realization that when we kind of push back on Copernican times, our modern philosophy, we might be making a mistake, because during the, the times of, in Copernican times, being lifted out of the center was not con being considered a demotion, it was considered a promotion because hell was in the center. You wanted to be outside of the center. So these are different philosophical perspectives, but interesting to contemplate. And then there's the exoplanet question now. Um, the race is on to find out if we can find evidence of life beyond Earth. But if we do, are we ready for that? Is that going to further make us feel insignificant or is it? Couldn't it be interpreted as very significant if life is possible or even probable throughout the galaxy and the universe? What's it going to do? These are speculative questions. We do know that we're connected to the universe. Um, we don't just observe the universe. We literally are connected with it. I, I like this quote from Jill Tarter of SETI fame. Um, she reminds us that we actually are made out of stardust. That sounds almost biblical. She says the iron in our blood, in our hemoglobin model, molecules in our blood, in your right hand, right now, that iron came from a star that blew up several billion years ago. Um, the iron in your left hand came from a different star. We are the laws of chemistry and physics as, as they have played out here on Earth and as we are now learning that planets are as common as stars. In fact, as I mentioned, most stars, as it turns out, have planets. So we're physically connected to the universe and to other planets. And in fact, these other planets are closer than we think. It turns out that the nearest star system to our sun, Alpha Centauri, and the little star in that system, Proxima Centauri, are the closest stars to us just about four light years away. And it turns out Proxima Centauri, the little one on the lower right there, um, has a planet that might be in its habitable zone. So here's this beautiful artist's conception of what it might look like on that planet, looking back at 
its parent star. We don't actually know what it looks like on that planet, but it's interesting to imagine. But we're now designing telescopes that will be, enable us to look at even our nearby stellar neighbors and look at their planets and see uh, what their atmospheres are like and could they be habitable for life and could they even so show biosignatures of life, kind of the, the products of biological activity in their atmosphere. The science is moving rapidly. Um, we'll, we'll be able to find out what fraction of stars might actually have planets that can harbor water and life as we know it and could recognize it. And we'll look for evidence, like on Earth, we know there's life going on here because we can see oxygen in the atmosphere. We know we have liquid water that's needed for life. We, we can see reflected light that is indicative of plant life on Earth. We can even detect methane in our atmosphere that's being expelled from all the livestock. So if we see these things in atmospheres of other planets, we might conclude that it's likely there's biological activity going on, but we have to rule out other explanations. And of course, we're interested uh, in simple life. That's the most likely thing that humans will detect. But our imaginations carry us forward into wondering if there are advanced life and civilizations beyond Earth. And what would their moral, ethical, and spiritual state be? C.S. Lewis famously wrote about uh, the, the spiritual state of life elsewhere in his uh, space trilogy, such as out of the silent planet, science fiction, but pointing the two deeper questions we have about the redemption of, of Christ on life on planet Earth. So here we are on our one planet that we at least we're sure there's life here. And for Christians, the question becomes quite personal because we believe that God, who is responsible for the universe, actually became incarnate in a body that had atoms forged in other stars, as Jill Tarter said about the atoms of iron in our body. Jesus Christ himself had a body that was related to the entire universe, and yet we believe that it is through this person of Christ that the universe was created and is currently upheld. Jesus came incarnate on this one planet and said that I have come that we may have life and we may have it to the full. So what are the implications of the incarnation of Jesus, God in the flesh on planet Earth, for the rest of the cosmos, especially if there's life beyond Earth? These are not new questions. It turns out that people have been speculating on this for centuries, um, but there are, there's new information now because this burst of discovery of real exoplanets is now rejuvenating these bigger philosophical and theological questions. All right, how do we respond to all this? Well, we can respond with wonder and awe and bewilderment and praise to God and sometimes loss of faith and sometimes feeling insignificant and sometimes feeling grateful and hopefully feeling curious. All of these responses are human and, and normal. And sometimes I have some, several of these feelings at the same time. Here's a rather uh, morose a response when Blaise Pascal was thinking about empty spaces. You could think of the long timeline of the universe or the vast distances of uninhabited space between stars. He said this, when I consider the short duration of my life swallowed up in the eternity before and after, the little space which I fill engulfed in the infinite immensity of spaces of which I'm ignorant and which know me not, I am frightened. And I'm astonished at being here rather than there, for there's no reason why here rather than there, why now rather than then. Who has put me here? By whose order and direction have this place and time been allotted to me? The eternal silence of these infinite spaces frightens me. I feel that way too sometimes. So are we significant? Do our lives matter? 
I would posit that perhaps our significance is apparent not from our place or our time span in the universe, but from the fact that we exist at all, a product of a universe or possibly even a multiverse that has evolved toward life and our consequential ability to contemplate good and evil and our place and purpose in the universe. Carl Sagan looked around and had this kind of reaction. He said, who are we? We find that we live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy, tucked away in some forgotten corner of a universe. Um, I think that's the way a lot of people in our society feel. They see in, in these wonderful images, they understand the vastness of the universe, but it makes them feel like their lives are pointless but you don't have to respond this way. I prefer the psalmist who said, O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've established, and he didn't even know about galaxies, but he had that feeling of insignificance at first. He said, what are human beings that you're mindful of them and mortals that you care for them or us? But then he went on and he said, and yet you've made them or us a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You've given them dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under their feet. Um, I think our significance can come from realizing we've been given this vast, this privilege of life and the privilege of looking out at the natural world around us and understanding how we connect and in studying it, that dominion there, the psalmist knew that, that it couldn't actually touch the moon and the stars, and most of the universe remains untouchable to us. But that dominion, I believe, can include scientific study, good scientific study that's designed to reveal truth for good purpose to help people. So our planet Earth is a gift and our ability to caretake this planet is a gift that we should take seriously as we look at our place in the universe. Um, the universe also, I hope, inspires. Um, there are many ways that inspiration expresses itself. Here's the space window in the National Cathedral inspired by space exploration. Um, here's my colleague at Goddard Space Flight Center, Gladys Kober. Some of you may recognize her from ASA, national ASA meetings, but she um, works with astronomical data uh, as her job, but she also works on in her own time to develop homeschool materials. So some of you who are familiar with astronomy homeschool materials, Gladys and her collaborators have created a marvelous book for on astronomy for students who are homeschooled, Christian students in Christian schools or homeschools, and I advise you to look it up. You can find that at uh, the website glimpseofhissplendor.org or .com. But anyway, Gladys also takes, has taken time, a vacation time, to go uh, visit an orphanage, and this particular orphanage has children of trauma. These children, for the most part, are, have parents who were killed as martyrs. Uh, so they had trauma in their lives, but they uh, are, have plenty of food and clothing. That's good. But these, these orphan children want the visits from Gladys because they want to hear about space. Space exploration lifts their spirits. They're excited to hear about it. They want to be part of the enterprise. They want to be astronauts. So we can use the knowledge that we're given of space to uplift the spirits of others. Here's a person, a, a student with visual impairments, but by tactile coding these images with, with uh, different textures so that a galaxy feels different from a comet, that feels different from a star, that feels different from a planet. People with visual impairments can see through touch what others see through eyes. And in this case, I was speaking to this class of students and they were every bit as excited by what they were seeing through touch as some of us are by what we see with our eyes as we imagine the majestic universe we live in. And let's remember that when the heavens are mentioned in scripture, they're most often mentioned in the context of praise for their creator. Um, 
not about arguments of age or scientific things. Those kinds of questions came much later. But in scriptures, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they're pouring forth speech and revealing knowledge, and yet they don't use words. No sound is heard from them. And yet their voice goes out into the earth, their words to the ends of the world. There's something about the majesty of the heavens that's giving a message to everyone on our planet. And that's why I believe using these better telescopes and technology can be a way of even seeing more of the glory of God and and, uh, humbling us to see what great God we serve and how much this God is aware of uh, uh, beyond what we are on this one planet. All right, let me quickly try to uh, to uh, finish up here. Um, uh, one way of uh, responding is to keep exploring. So the universe never runs out of things to find out about. Where there's always new discoveries, new mysteries, and new surprises. Here's a few of them. Um, we've been studying the universe with telescopes, collecting different kinds of radiation over the years, visible light, infrared light, radio waves. But since Einstein and his colleagues uh, uh, did their work, it's been predicted that there can be another way that information is is passed across the universe, and these can be distortions of space-time itself. So uh, theoretically, when massive objects are accelerated, um, they distort space-time. And we've had detectors on the ground for years trying to pick up measurements of tiny distortions of space traveling through. The LIGO detector is, is, is the main one, but there are others coming online. But it was just a few years ago that finally an event was actually detected. So um, the event measured that you see on the right was the LIGO detection of a distortion of space-time passing through. The left is a simulation of two black holes about to merge, and the merging of two black holes, basically two dead stars, would create the conditions needed for just exactly the signal that was picked up. Now, black holes are just giant stars, or at least stellar mass black holes can be just the remnants of a giant star that's run out of fuel, exploded, and its core has collapsed. And since a lot of stars are binaries, when they die out, a lot of them are going to end up as binary black holes or maybe binary neutron stars. And uh, eventually their orbits will decay and they will merge. So we should be seeing more and more of these gravitational wave events as our detectors get better. A black hole was imaged. Of course, light can't actually escape from a black hole. So what's imaged is right around the rim of the black hole. But this has been a quest for so many years and it finally came to fruition uh, very recently. And that's what the, the surroundings of a black hole actually look like. We're learning more about our own solar system. Here's Jupiter in beautiful visible light from the Hubble telescope. We're learning that the storm on Jupiter is changing, that the weather on our planets changes, that big red spot is shrinking. It's a giant hurricane. As it shrinks, the outer winds are getting faster. And if we look at it in ultraviolet light, we see also this little uh, emission at the top. This is basically the northern lights of Jupiter. charged particles from the sun interacting with Jupiter's magnetic field and making a show in ultraviolet light. So we can now use telescopes like Hubble to see not only visible, but ultraviolet light and all the activity of planets in our solar system. And then that can be done in complement with probes like Juno that are already there at the Jupiter system. Um, I'm going to skip through this, but we do complementary work. Europa Clipper mission is going to be going to visit a moon of Jupiter um, and check out its environment. This is an icy moon that we believe has a liquid water ocean under the ice, and we can even see evidence of water vapor in the atmosphere of Europa and water being expelled from cracks in the ice. So this mission will be very exciting. Um, we've got a probe, OSIRIS-REx, that's, that's returning samples from asteroid Bennu that it's now visited. It visited this crumbly asteroid, got a sample, and now it's going to bring it right back for us to 
uh, to really study in our labs what exactly is in an asteroid. So it's just very cool to me that we can combine probe observations with telescope observations with human curiosity. And mainly, I hope from all this, we're learning about the precious gift of our own home planet. This is looking back at the rising sun over the limb of Earth from the space shuttle after they had serviced the Hubble Space Telescope the last time a few years ago. And that backlit atmosphere of planet Earth, you can see that very thin arc of blue light. That's our atmosphere. Very thin, very beautiful, very fragile. Um, so I hope that by our studies of the universe, we are more inspired to take care of the garden God has given us in our own home, planet Earth. Here's some good resources. If you like uh, some of the things I mentioned and want to know more, you can take a screenshot of this, which I recommend. But these are some of my favorite books, organizations. You see the ASA there. Um, you see the, the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion program, or DOSER, which is part of a science society. It's not a religious program, but it helps to build dialogue between religious communities and scientists. I direct that program, so I hope you'll check it out. BioLogos is a wonderful organization that, that uh, helps uh, show the harmony between science and biblical faith. And I'm on the board of BioLogos, so check out their website and resources. And then there's a newer organization called Science for the Church you should check out, and a very thoughtful organization based in the UK called the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion. All of these are good resources. And for discussion and personal thought and group discussion, you can download a free book from nae.net. Search for it there. It's called When God and Science Meet. Um, uh, different essays from different Christians in different fields of science and and theology, and you uh, will have everything you need to stimulate a good conversation, either with yourself or with your friends or in a small group. So let's praise God for the universe and praise God for the gift of science that allows us to explore and understand the wonders of creation. Amen. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and we can have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Um, so let's take, let's do some question and answers. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, use the, um, the reactions or the raise your hand option, either way. I would love to hear not only questions, but if people have reactions or thoughts, you know, how does it make you feel when you see some of these images or you contemplate the size of the universe, the, the numbers of stars and galaxies, how does it make you feel? I would love to know. Right. And you could um, put your question or reaction in the chat box too, if you'd like. All right, McKenna. Yeah, hi, I have a quick question. I would love to hear like what excites you the most out of like everything you've talked about or where like astro like stuff is like heading in that direction. Like what is the most exciting thing to you? Oh, I have many, um, but I think well, I, I do think one of the most amazing achievements in astronomy is this, this detection, this time machine detection that we can actually see early galaxies in our own universe at their baby stage and see how they've changed over time. I mean, that's a phenomenal accomplishment and it tells us something about this long-term cosmic history, which has led to life. Um, but in a more... Uh, closer sense of space and time. I really think it's interesting that we are sending these probes to planets and moons in our own solar system. I would love to know if there's microbial life in the oceans of Europa. I would, and hopefully we don't bring it there ourselves. Um, I would love to know if Mars ever had microbial life and if we could figure that out for sure. 
Um, and I like the idea of using, ex you know, exploring around our own solar system to then help us understand better what we're seeing when we look to other star systems and their planets. We can't send probes there yet, it's too far away, but we can examine the atmospheres of some of these exoplanets. And if we understand what we're seeing in the, in the chemistry there by, by analogy to what we see in our own solar system, we'll have a better grasp of what's going on in other star systems. You know, something very interesting happened in the last couple, year or so that I didn't show a slide of, but we detected two objects whizzing through our solar system that did not originate in our solar system. Um, we, we have always believed that comets and asteroids originate in our solar system in different regions. Of course, there's an asteroid belt and there are there's comet belts in the outer solar system and the comets and asteroids that we've known about and discovered have all either been in those belts or been disrupted from them by interactions with planets, but it's all been confined to our own larger solar system. Well, we've since been detecting, starting to detect objects whizzing through our solar system that have a trajectory that indicate they did not originate in our star system, that they were ejected from some other star system through gravitational interactions there. These are interstellar objects. One of them is called Oumuamua, uh, this asteroid-like weird thing that whizzed through the solar system, and more recently, Comet Borisov, um, which stu we studied with different kinds of telescopes. It seems to be very ca carbon-rich. So whatever star system it was ejected from had a lot of carbon in it. Uh, so I think studying these uh, interstellar visitors is also going to become a very interesting science. And it's because our telescopes are getting better. We're able to do these more sensitive surveys that we're able to pick up some of this, some of these phenomena that we've never seen before. So I think that's exciting too. All right. Anyone else? I would like someone to comment on how these kinds of discoveries impacts your faith perspective. Does it, does it, enhance it or does it challenge it? Um, does it worry you? Does it make you feel joy? You know, what does it do to your faith perspective when you see these kinds of discoveries? I'd like, I'd like someone to be brave and, and talk about that. We'll start with Christine. Okay, sure. Um, no, for sure. I, I, um, I think when I study and when I learn more about the universe around us, uh, the scope, it, it's like every time I learn more, I learn there's more that I don't know. And, um, and, and that it's much more vast than I thought before. Uh, and, and each step that I learn, I feel like, wow, I mean, God is ever so much more than I could possibly imagine. I mean, I can't even imagine that, I mean, this new that James Webb telescope is going to be a million miles away. I don't even know how to estimate where that is. Um, it's and at yet L2. That, if you know your little oh, okay. points, right. that's at L2. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so I know that that's still, you know, just right in our neighborhood, right? That's not even beyond any planets from us and yet we have this little solar system that goes around in the milky way galaxy and that's one of many galaxies and the more i learn the more in awe i am of um of what exists and what kind of creator there must have been that there, there is who uh, came up with all these ideas and planned it this way and, and his providence that allows all things to hold together in him. And um, to, to me, it inspires worship. Good, thank you. Anybody else have thoughts they wanna share? This is Joe Sheldon here. Hi, Joe. Hi, how are you? Great. Just thoroughly enjoyed your presentation tonight. Thank you for very much. Your question is how does 
what we could call the expanding universe influenced my understanding of God and theology a bit. And I have recently finished reading uh, theologian John Walton's book, The Lost World of Genesis 1. You may be familiar with that. Yep, great book. Where he describes Genesis 1 as a description of God creating his temple and that the entire universe is the temple of God. Mm -hmm. And what I find is that we tend to constrict God into a very small box that we try to understand. And as I begin to look at the majesty of the universe and the presentation that you gave us tonight, uh, it just strikes me how large that God is that we worship. Me too. I sometimes have a hard time though, and we'll see if it, this is true for any of you. I mean, I can be so amazed and impressed and awe-inspired by this unimaginable universe, but I really need God's help for something that's, you know, much more urgent, practical, and needed today. So how do you relate the God of the seemingly infinite universe to the God who cares about the number of hairs on our head and, and notices when a sparrow falls and cares. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a God who's both huge in, in understanding and providence for a universe we can't even imagine to the same God that cares about individuals. Um, I have a hard time wrapping my head around that too. And, and, you know, and then wondering, you know, does it, does it matter? I mean, there's all of this majesty in the universe, but Jesus didn't spend time telling his disciples about this. You know, it's taken thousands of years for us to uncover some of this. So it, was it not important for us to know these things? You know, so these are mystery questions. Uh, why is it that humans have been around for countless thousands of years, but we only now are given the privilege of, of understanding the broader universe that we're in. Is that because God is only now wanting us to know these things or that it doesn't matter or what, you know, these are mysteries that no one can answer, but it's, you know, these things cross my mind. And then our lives being short, I think that is something that's always a puzzle to us, right? We live in this universe that that covers times and spaces we can't imagine and that, and yet our lives are fragile and, uh, and, you know, even long lives are short relative to the cosmos. And some people uh, don't get very long to be alive at all. So why is that? So these are some of the, the, the head scratching places where, and of course there's the question of suffering, right? You know, why would the God of the majestic universe allow cruelty and, and suffering um, for such short-lived creatures as we. So, you know, these are the, the, the puzzling questions that can come about. Also, the, the questions of natural uh, natural disasters come about, you know, the, 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 for, the majestic formation of, of planets and, and on planet Earth, the plate tectonics that we rely on to rejuvenate our atmosphere also cause earthquakes that kill people, you know, so how can something be so good and bad at the same time? Um, and can it all be explained away by human sin? These are theological questions that are very, very difficult to simplify. So when I show the majestic universe, I don't mean to make it seem that there's a very simple connect the dots between looking at the amazing things we're discovering and concluding that that all is great because there's so many challenging questions and and the long term future of the universe. If you only look at the at the physics, you know, the expansion of the universe, the long term future is pretty bleak. It looks like eventually the stars all die out and go cold and dark. Um, that's really and, and then everything is forgotten. You know, that's that's the future without God. But but there's a big but there. We have this incredible, these incredible revelations from God. Um, first of all, the fact that the universe has produced life at all through these majestic stellar processes I've told you about. Secondly, we have 
the cognizance of God from ancient peoples and the prophets that revealed to us some of, something of the reality of God. And then, of course, for Christians, the, the actual incarnation of God in the person of Jesus Christ, showing us the very nature of God um, and that God is love, you know, that God has an eternal purpose for our lives. Uh, this is our hope. It's more than just what we would conclude by only what we look at with telescopes and microscopes. We have other information to correlate with this. And it gives us a great hope, a great sense of purpose that there will be in some way, shape or form, a new heavens and a new earth, um, whether it's a complete reinvention of the cosmos or whether Christ's return will inaugurate a new way of being in this one. Um, I'm, I'm not the right person to answer that question, but I do know that we're promised an eternity with the, the Christ of the cosmos in charge and great hope. So somehow these observations of the universe need to enrich our humility and our awe before God. But also combined with the other things God has revealed to us, most especially in Jesus Christ, that we have an awesome God who cares about the material world and our physical lives and has a very bright future for each and every one of us here. So, so somehow we've got to correlate that all together. All right. I have a question and I believe it's from Kay Lynn is I think how you say her name. And she says, which figure in history do you most resonate with? when you spoke about the different people who gave, um, talked about if the universe had a purpose. And how do you deal with those who disagree about the universe being connected with Christianity? Hmm. I have to think about the, the which person question because there's just so many people in contemporary culture and in history who have, who I find their thoughts intriguing and, and helpful. Um, John Polkinghorne being one of them that I, that I mentioned. Um, I, as to the second question, I, you know, I think if you're only looking at the universe itself, it's, it's perfectly legitimate for people to come to different conclusions about whether the universe is purposeful or not. I, um, I can truly understand that someone who, who looks at the same data and sees how our universe has had a beginning and has progressed to the point of producing stars with planets and life could conclude um, that it's purposeless because looking to the long-term future, it just seems like everything's going to die out and that's the end of it. So what is the point? Um, but I would argue that for me, and again, these are philosophical questions, not things you can prove one way or the other with science. But to me, the fact that, you know, the, the age old question, why is there anything at all? Why is there something and not nothing? Um, is a very good question. And the fact that the something that there is, the universe has, has led to um, life that can contemplate itself and think about purpose and even recognize good and evil. I mean, one of, to me, one of the strongest supporting evidences for the truth of Christianity is that our, our faith um, does not deny the presence of evil and wrong and suffering, that these concepts are real, um, that things are not the way they ought to be. And Christian faith acknowledges that. But the fact that we know what ought to be and what ought not to be, and we can differentiate that and we can admit that we are part of the ought not to be part of life is really astounding because if all there was was simply natural survival evolution, first of all, many of the activities we take up are unnecessary and wasting of time and energy. And secondly, 
there wouldn't be any such thing as evil because it's all part of just the natural uh, carrying out of natural forces and things. And yet um, Christianity acknowledges that there is evil. It is wrong to murder. It is wrong to lie and deceive. It is wrong to uh, mistreat those who are, um, who have uh, less fortune than, than you do. Um, these kinds of things, I think, lean toward the direction of truth for me. And likewise, looking at the universe and its progression toward life, um, to me, is more congruent with a purpose for the universe. And that purpose being to produce life um, than purposelessness. And, and I wouldn't be surprised personally if the universe is filled with life. I mean, it would be in keeping with God's character of all kinds of robust, weird life on planet earth and every nook and cranny. If there's also interesting life that either exists or has existed in other extreme, what we would call extreme environments beyond earth, but whether or not they have the same moral quandaries and need the same kinds of redemption that we do, we don't know. And whether God in Christ what was done on planet earth is, is sufficient for all life throughout the universe. Um, we, I would say so somehow, but you know, these are things that God has not fully revealed to us. So, um, so I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but the short answer is that I think philosophical conclusions are not dictated by the science, but one can make the argument that what we are seeing is more in line with a purposeful universe than one that has no purpose. And that's my conclusion. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to just tie it up with one final question. If sure. someone is here tonight that, that doesn't know Jesus or hasn't um, decided to follow him or be part of a Christian faith, uh, what would you recommend where they could get more information and learn what it means to be a Christian or to follow Jesus? Hmm. Well, first and foremost, I would say uh, pick up the Bible. They, that might, say, might sound trite, but some of the most interesting discussions of Jesus and the connections of Jesus to the cosmos can be found in the New Testament. Uh, my favorite of the writings of John, where uh, the, the Word of God is described as as being made flesh and in Jesus Christ, and so. Um, and there are other passages that talk about this aspect of God um, being responsible for the universe so that the whole point of the universe is not just the forces and the material and the energy that we can study with science. It's ultimately about a person and, and relationships and meaning. So I would encourage reading the New Testament, reading the Gospel of John and um, the, the, the books of, of, uh, that start with first John and, uh, Romans and Hebrews, uh, those to me are, are powerful books in scripture. And then I would advise going to some of these websites that I, that I showed that can really talk about how and why people of rational minds who believe in the scientific picture of of the world and understand physics and chemistry and astrophysics and cosmology also commit to following Jesus Christ. How does that fit together? And I think um, some good places to find that are the, uh, the, the testimonies one can see at BioLogos and um, also um, I'm, I'm gonna let's see if I can put some of this in the chat. Um, and the ASA, um, those are the things that come to mind, but maybe you have some other resources or some other directions, Christine, that you would point people to? Uh, I think that's a really great place to start and anybody could always contact me or one of the other ASA leaders if they have questions too, um, either through the ASA website or um, if you wanted to direct message me now and give me your contact information and I would be happy to answer any questions about that too. Yeah, and so, I also think that uh, some of these um, 
online resources like from the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion or it can be quite helpful. Uh, my own journey, which I didn't share, is that I grew up in a Christian family in a rural part of the U.S. in, in the state of Arkansas. And we didn't know any scientists and we weren't anywhere near any scientific institution. And, uh, you know, we were on a cattle ranch and my parents didn't even have the chance to go to college, but they were very open and, and supportive of their kids getting a college education. And I love wandering around the, the farm, you know, wandering around the streams and the meadows. And I love animals and it made me uh, just naturally love nature, but also uh, naturally enjoy science because science is a way of studying the natural world. And, you know, we were, we were taught in our faith community that not only does God love and teaches us to love, but that God is responsible for all of creation. And I think that gave me the, 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 uh, the sense that studying the natural world is a way of honoring God. Now, when it comes to interpreting very specific passages about the creation and other things in the Bible, um, uh, you know, I was taught certain things, but I was also taught that we have to be humble, that God hasn't revealed all the details of his creative works in, in scripture, that he's given us other gifts like science and our minds to learn more of the details. And I think that freed me up to to be able to choose to go into physics and then astronomy and study the details of creation and see how it correlates with the greater messages in, in scripture. And then I've also personally been uh, very dependent on this relationship with God in my science career, you know, helping me through the, the difficult and sometimes mundane work. You know, it's not all about me getting to rejoice in these glorious images. Most of my work every day is much more tedious and much more stressful and very mundane. And, and you know, how do I handle these challenges of, uh, and, and uh, um, day-to-day life challenges and, and fears and worries and unsurety and, um, and to make sure that I'm doing something that that uh, that is good with the life that I've been given. Well, that requires a daily relationship with God and looking to Jesus as our savior and helper and friend. And so it's this kind of living relationship that has, if, if you will, if I, if I may use the word kind of evolved as I've grown in my science career um, to not only think of God in terms of these big philosophical questions, but also uh, look to God um, as the one who helps me when I'm under stress and need help, like tonight. I have a proposal that's due in two hours, and I believe God is going to help me get that in. So there we go. <laughs> but I won't Bye. say it hasn't been stressful. <laughs> this week has been uh, very, very stressful. So, uh, so um, you know, following Christ is, is a personal journey that I hope each of you and each of us is on. We sure appreciate you being here tonight and knowing that you had the proposal due today too. That was um, so glad you could make it. And everyone let's give Jennifer a round of applause. Maybe use your reaction to say high five. Okay. Um, And I think that's really all that we have plan for this evening, but if anybody wants to just stay around and chat, um, I can hang out here a few minutes and whoever has questions or wants to just visit uh, for a little bit longer, that would be great. Uh, Otherwise, we're so glad that everybody has come and appreciate your presentation and, and the work that you're doing and hope your proposal is received well. Thank you very much. And, and I hope each of us, when we have the chance on a clear night, just take the time to go outside and get away from lights and look up, even just with your eyes or binoculars, and take the time to be quiet and be amazed. Um, it does wonders for the soul, okay? Yeah, and we're going to try to do an actual observatory event. We have looked into doing one in person tonight, but with COVID, uh, the place we wanted to go is not available. I understand. All so. right. And to all of you sending greetings and messages in the chat, I'm seeing them all. So thank you very much um, to each and every one of you. All right, I'll be off. All right, thank you so much.